So, good morning everyone from New York. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cummins and I'm a member of the steering committee for the Alliance of NGOs and CSOs for South Side Cooperation. And I'm the moderator for today's event. The event is hosted by the Global Policy Insights and it's uh, a talk on a political economy post COVID-19. So for our panelists, we have three lovely panelists representing various diverse ideologies and perspectives from all over the world. And for the, for the format of the questions, uh, I'll have five questions. The first three questions will be directed towards each panelist. The last two will be open for discussion amongst the panelists. And then I encourage anyone who's participating to write their question in the chat. So now without further ado, let me get on to introductions. So our first panelist is Arpit Chaturvedi. So Arpit is a CEO of the Global Policy Insight, which is an Indian-based think tank that has connections in the UK and Washington DC. He also serves as an instructor and coordinator for the Indian School of Public Policy. <clears throat> he graduated from Cornell University with his master's in public administration and the Symbiosis Center for Management and Human Resource Development with an MBA. While at Cornell, he served as the editor-in-chief of the Cornell Policy Review. So that's Arpit. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you, John. Thank <laughs> no you, problem. John. Next, so I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. <laughs> Our next panelist is Nezat Sivim. Did, did I get it correctly? Okay, thank you. Correct. So Nezat is a senior multimedia journalist with management experiences in prominent international media outlets, such as Euronews, Star TV, and CNN Turk. During her time at Euronews, she has assisted in launching news platforms and focus on digital transformations in a newsroom. She has three master's degrees, which is two more than I do. And in her most recent master's, she graduated with a master's of science with focusing on digital marketing and media from King's College London. We're grateful to have you here. I'm happy to be here also, thank you. Excellent. And last but certainly not least is Senk, is Sinek Siddhar, did I get that right? Jenk, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a CEO of Global Wonks, which is a technology enabled platform that will use proprietary matching analytics to connect private and public sector sector clients with experts who understand the world. Jenk right, is a global risk expert with a vast experience of assisting top financial institutions, multinational corporations, risk management, risk management firms, and legal firms operating in high risk regions. In 2012, Jenk has been selected as one of the top 99 foreign policy leaders under the age of 33. He has a Master's of Arts in International Relations and International Economics from John Hopkins University. And thank you for being here. We're very grateful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So on to the questions. So the first question is for Arpit. So what are some of the major governmental and political barriers that hinder the growth of economies in emerging countries? Sure. Uh, thank you, John. So emerging countries, and I'm going to focus on uh, a number of developing countries, including India, when I'm saying this. Uh, so with a lot of emerging countries, there's also this baggage of uh, colonialism, especially countries in South Asia, if we're talking about India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and uh, that baggage comes with one peculiar institution, which is uh, you know, generally considered the relic of colonialism in these countries, which is uh, the civil services. Uh, that's the bureaucracy. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, I was interviewing somebody today and uh, you know, this person was writing uh, a book by the name of, uh, you know, a book on bureaucracy by the name of Faces of Democracy. And you know, I got into a debate when we started uh, debating that why, why, why are you calling that a book as a face of democracy? Because the way that uh, civil services is uh, 
modeled in countries like uh, India, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc., is that uh, you know, uh, in terms of its structures, functions, culture, they uh, function uh, pretty much the same way that uh, they did uh, mm -hmm. in the colonial era. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it is the governance uh, structures which becomes a huge problem uh, when implementing uh, certain policies. So especially when uh, COVID hit uh, these developing countries, what happens in any emergency, the demand for governance goes up. And when the demand for governance goes up, you need a robust uh, civil service system to be managing all of that governance. Now, uh, just to state some facts, in India, the number of Indian administrative services officers, you have uh, one per every 250,000 people. So these developing countries have a huge number of people. Uh, the population size is huge. But at the same time, the number of people to coordinate with these masses to coordinate with the people generally are so few that the system easily becomes overwhelmed. So uh, not only in terms of the quantity of people, as I said, uh, just the whole adaptivity of the civil service and my thesis at Cornell was on, uh, uh, my thesis was on public administration and specific, uh, specifically focused on civil service uh, performance management. And what I found in my study was, uh, you know, a lot of times the way performance management is done in the civil services is really uh, old school. You still have, you know, everybody getting an eight out of 10 rating. So, uh, you know, the assumption is that everybody is kind of doing good if you're a civil servant and there's a very low degree of accountability once you're there in the services. Now that becomes a problem in addition to that, uh, a problem uh, which developing countries face is regards to e-governance. So uh, one is that internet penetration is low. Uh, literacy levels are pretty low. So in India, if you compare it with China, for example, uh, India literacy levels are 74.6% as opposed to China, which has a literacy level of 96 point something percent. So even if e-governance is implemented effectively, uh, so as to reach more people, there are uh, challenges in terms of internet penetration and literacy. On the other side, there's again the perspective issue comes in, wherein e-governance in whatever form it exists in India, it is just a one-way street. It's just a one-way conversation when the government is uh, sending information on a number of schemes, on a number of policies to people. But then there's hardly any accountability in terms of... Uh, a, the people going back to the government and suggesting them uh, certain solutions which are localized. And B, uh, we hardly have any idea about uh, what the government is doing with the data when a person signs up on an e-government platform. Uh, the government gets to know what the people are doing, but then uh, people do not really get to know how the government is using their uh, data. So there's this whole issue of accountability, literacy, and uh, the whole perspective issue where it becomes a one-way conversation rather than a two-way street where a person in my locality can also get back to the government and tell them that hey my sewage line is not working can you do something about it so that becomes the problem then the third problem uh, you know just building on the whole uh, percep uh, perceptual challenge is uh, this whole culture of local governance and public participation in governance uh, in India, for example, and I know that in other developing countries, it's very similar, except for a number of developing countries in Latin America, which have developed a good culture of public participation at the local level. Uh, but in a majority of developing countries, the problem is that uh, public participation, a lot of times is just done in the name. And a lot of times it's the state government, which, is, uh, which has all of the uh, control over the funds all of the control over, uh, you know, who is going to, which government is going to spend its money, how. And in the face of a crisis, uh, you see, it's very important for the local governments to have the reins of power in their hands because the needs are local. Uh, so, for example, if I am, my hometown is Firozabad in India, which is a glass industrial town, and it's dependent on uh, labor, uh, which manufactures glass in factories. Now the needs of a town where uh, everything is in shutdown, people are not able to uh, go to their 
factories where they earn daily wages is going to be extremely different from let's say a new delhi or a lucknow which are state capital so uh, the needs are local but then uh, everything right now all of the policies are either managed by the state government or the central government uh, in india so uh, like in the united states you have a state government receiving funds from the center under the title 6 of the civil rights act uh, you can hardly say that there's something to parallel that in uh, countries like india right now where state governments are pretty much dependent uh, where local governments are pretty much dependent on uh, the state or the federal government so i think these become challenges in terms of uh, responsiveness and adaptability to deal with the crisis uh, like corona where the demand for governance has shot up exponentially all right <laughs> Thank you for the insight. We really appreciate it. I really liked your point about e-governance. I think that's a, a very important point to bring up, yeah. and yeah. Um, especially how a lot of a lot of uh, technology and government services are now have to become digitalized because of the pandemic. I see that as a very big and important step. So, thank you for bringing that. Yeah. All right. So, next question is for Neza. So your question is how have the world leaders and governments managed the crisis so far what has been the effects of bad management to the to the political scene and how has these mishandlings shaped the future of the political scene globally and nationally i'll mm -hmm. put these questions in the chat so that everyone who either just joined or um who has been a part of the chat can see what the questions are sure uh thank you john for the questions so uh it is sure that the speed and scope of the coronavirus crisis pose extraordinary challenges for leaders in today's vital institutions including governments so it is somehow understandable why so many have missed opportunities for decisive action and honest communication so that's the case because this is an unprecedented crisis none of the current world leaders had had to manage a pandemic like this before as we can say so in terms of crisis management and leadership in national scale uh, this uncertain situation has caused leaders to delay further action and to don't downplay the threat until the situation became clearer in order to prevent uh, you know taking the wrong steps or making people anxious unnecessarily which still has been the case in many countries even in the ones we thought they could handle the situation much better so there has been and still a hard decision for the governments here shutting down the whole country economy limiting people's freedom of movement therefore flatten the infection curve but then risking to lose the public support after the negative effects to economy especially starts to arise or on the other hand uh, experimenting other options like herd immunity trying to keep economy on going as much as possible but then again when the infection rate cannot be controlled again risking a huge loss in public support possibly a huge crisis uh, not many governments can survive and especially in the beginning of this pandemic before the impact and the threat of the pandemic was widely apparent and recognized it was a kind of a like daring act to impose a total lockdown for many world leaders so but yes there has been big contrast among world governments response from the beginning of the crisis so therefore the situation they are facing now as well so one of the most prominent examples here we can give the difference in between the governments of new zealand and the uk so there's a very popular video is circulating in internet called new zealand versus britain covid response so if you haven't watched that video you've seen how new zealand government has taken pandemic seriously from the beginning with the slogan of hit it hard hit it early and imposing toughest measures like a total lockdown from the beginning while uk was testing the herd immunity strategy and the government found uh, measures like lockdown unnecessary so therefore now even the first case confirmed around end of january in uk no aggressive social distancing measures were put in place around until 23rd march mm. so what we see now uh, new zealand has no new corona cases for days number of recovered patients are rising and there are no additional deaths in contrast in uk which has the 
highest level of tax in Europe with around 35,000, followed by Italy around 30, 32,000. So in general, yes, many governments underestimated the speed and the scope of the pandemic. And yes, swifter and stricter actions could have saved more lives. But these measures are so stark and the crisis is so unprecedented, even for the many scientists and health professionals. That's why they couldn't give a clear guidance to the governments. And it took a while for some authorities to understand the seriousness of the situation. But in the end, uh, I think the situation in Italy has made everybody, especially in Europe, clear that tough measures are absolutely necessary. So if I may answer your second question, like how these mishandlings shape the future scene, political scene globally and nationally. Uh, first of all, uh, European governments have started easing their lockdown restrictions, we see one by one. Uh, it's too early to say now it's all over. It's time to take lessons and move on. Just, just today, just recent days, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control warned that the prospect of a second wave of a coronavirus infection across Europe is uh, no longer a distant theory. And the question is when and how big. So there's a still long and uncertain way to go for the public and for the governments and key decision makers. But if we take the effects of this crisis in global scale, sure COVID-19 will be the, one of the most significant events of the decade, and it will cause fundamental changes in the economy, politics, and also our way of living. So historians might have an optimistic stance here and can tell us that most of the crisis and disaster have set the stage for a change and often for the better, like the global flu epidemic in 1918 mm -hmm. helped to create national health services in many European countries. So in a totally rational world, since we fight against the same enemy, uh, we can assume that an international pandemic would lead to a greater internationalism, unity and cooperation because it's all one battle. But unfortunately, it's not that rational world we live in. So we've already started to see demonization, populism, and calls for isolation, inflamed xenophobia, and racial scapegoating, especially efforts of demonization China and Chinese nationals. So like in the US, President Trump has already branded coronavirus as you know Chinese. So he keeps using the pandemic as a pretext for tightening the borders and accepting fewer asylum seekers. Same goes for the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. He just recently announced that they are fighting a two-front war. One is migration and other one is coronavirus. And he says there is a logical connection between the two as bo they both spread with movement. So far-right leaders in countries like France, Italy and Spain have also taken the advantage of the outbreak to call for tightening the borders. So this is one concern for me, actually. Also, there is another growing concern here is the rise of surveillance efforts on individuals by governments and some private companies. So this pandemic can be a perfect base for governments looking to monitor their you know, citizens even more closely, and also for companies looking to get rich by basically doing the same. So today in China, drones search for people without face masks and they warn them by their you know, building speakers. Germany, Austria, Italy, and Belgium, they are all using data, anonymized for now, but they are using data from major telecommunications companies to track people's movement. In Israel as well, the National Security Agency is now allowed to access infected individuals' phone records. So, on the pessimistic but not so unrealistic side, we can imagine our future lives can end up being similar to what we have seen in the movie of Minority Report. So this is another concern for me. And also there is another problem for the public authorities here is that they are not in full control of public and there is a huge trend of mistrust to the governments and regulatory bodies. In autocratic countries, people can be compelled to follow uh, government orders through fear of consequences if they disobey to those orders. But uh, in democratic states, governments cannot control people in this way. So instead, they must rely on citizens being willing to heed the information and guidance offered by public officials. But the question here is that 
how likely are citizens accept official information when so many of them don't trust politicians and governments? Uh, public polls shows that uh, mistrust in the governments and the authorities in the global scale is very high. So there are more people who don't believe officials than who do believe. So people often resist official information and guidance because they think it's biased and partial. Uh, also, making sharp and sudden policy changes like in the UK, you know, from herd immunity to total lockdown, um, makes people think that the key decision makers don't have a clear idea of how to manage the pandemic and this crisis. So again, the governments, they need to work on their credibility, transparency and authority. So for now, I can say that the future don't look so bright for many world leaders on this context. So this might push for them maybe for a drastic change in their strategy. And lastly, if we talk about leadership and management, if we call this as a, let's say, coronavirus leadership test, uh, finally officials, world leaders can see that passing this test requires to act in an urgent, honest and transparent way of management. I mean, they need to recognize the mistakes are inevitable and they need to accept those mistakes instead of blaming the other parties. All right, thank you for that. Um, you gave us a lot of useful content and it's a lot to unpack, but towards the end of, towards the end of your answer, you mentioned that democratic states, it's hard for democratic states to control, uh, pretty much control a population, control a citizens. So I guess a little bit as a follow-up question to that, do you think in this context, since it's harder for a democratic state to control the uh, behaviors of the citizens, do you think an authoritarian regime would be better for managing a pandemic than a democratic one? This is a very tricky question, to be honest. Um, of course, China now getting, they are getting better, you know, controlling the disease and they already praise their kind of, let's say this autocratic government, you know, management system, because like this, they can handle, you know, they can manage the spread of the disease. But even if we, even if I say here, that will be better for public health, I don't think so it can be case anytime in, you know, developed countries or, you know, continents like Europe or in states. It, it, it can't work. So the only way again to make people follow the government orders to make them believe to authorities, to media and other kind of public bodies. People need to believe that you can't push them to, you know, follow the orders in this kind of countries. You need to make them believe in you. All right. Thank you so much for your answer. All right. So next, this next question is for Jenk. So Many have argued that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution refers to advancements in technology and AI. What does this mean for the global economy, specifically for developing countries? Uh, thank you, John. It's a pleasure uh, to speak at the panel. Uh, I think things change too fast uh, in today's age. We were talking about fourth industrial revolution just five years ago when the World Economic Forum basically coined the term, and it was more about uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, cloud computing, uh, big data. Uh, of course, those concepts are still very relevant, and they are relevant, they are changing how businesses operate, how new, country, new companies are started you know, all over the world. Uh, but I think if we talk about technology changes, in light of how COVID will change lives, it is important to mention that COVID really didn't change anything. COVID crisis accelerated trends that have already started almost a decade ago, or two decades ago, with advances in communications technology, um, computer technology, uh, new technologies that were listed under uh, for industrial revolutions, such as, you know, the concepts I mentioned. So I think one important thing to say that, you know, we didn't wake up one day in January or February and all oh, now the world has changed. The world has been changing and many individuals, companies, organizations, and governments have been avoiding to change, you know. So I've been a 
champion of feature work. I've been talking on the concept how feature work uh, will uh, change our lives, uh, how it's relevant to artificial intelligence, advanced communication technologies. And I've been arguing long time that if you are in the knowledge industry or with the old categorization such as white color versus blue color or whatever, I think that is an acronym. Uh, definition as of today but let's say if you're in the knowledge industry if you earn uh, your income uh, through your knowledge and education and if you I mean I've been saying that last two years and if you still can't do your job working from home you need to go and do something about it because the whole world uh, has been you know um, kind of avoiding that subject that you know eight to five type of office schedules and uh, insistence on having workspaces was you know a major change that was you know um, that avoided so what I'm saying is like everyone start working from homes and people who cannot from work from home are being seriously punished after the COVID work because they cannot earn income I mean, if you are, I mean, look, I mean, if you're a bartender and you like your job and that's fine, it's a very bad situation, what happened? There will be bars and I want to go to bars and order a drink from a bartender. You know, it's not going to change. It's kind of specific area. But if you are, again, in a knowledge industry and if you cannot continue, if, if you cannot continue earning income from your home, that's a problem. You know, if you're a lawyer, and you have all analog files at your cabin, like file cabinet, and you cannot function without having an office space, you're basically not doing well in the age of technology and um, industrial revolution. So, so it's very important that, I think we want to highlight the individuals and organizations must have adopted those change, changes much before COVID. So if you get caught off guard, that's kind of the reason is because you didn't make personal or organizational uh, preparations for the change. So I think it shows us how important to uh, understand what those macro changes will impact your micro lifestyle. So I think that one lesson that we should understand. The second one is looking at the specifics of this crisis. Um, so if you if you consider that crisis as one of the like you know major uh, shifts in business and economic landscape, I think we should look at one of them that happened only 12 years ago, right? 13 years ago, 2007, 2008 uh, economic crisis. So let's see what that crisis changed lives. Uh, what kind of new actors emerge after that change? Um, that change was about, sorry, that crisis was about uh, going beyond, uh, you know, your like basically people buying houses they basically don't, can't afford, signing mortgages 3x, 4x of their financial availability, but just thinking that the situation is sustainable. So I go and live beyond my, uh, you know, financial capabilities. Many Americans. Uh, that's what many Americans did and many in other parts of the developed world. But what happened, they couldn't pay their mortgages, the banks collapsed, uh, there was a huge pressure on the financial institutions and huge pressure on people's livelihood. And what happened, their companies like Airbnb came up. And what was Airbnb? Rent a portion of your house and get additional income to pay the mortgage. And then Uber came. Like Uber uh, was basically, oh, I bought a car, I'm paying $600, is much beyond my paying ability, but I can drive that car two hours a day and earn additional $150 so they can help me to pay my uh, car payment. <laughs> so uh, those changes basically created new companies and we can generalize it as shared economy. Uh, so shared economy was the like overarching concept of technology landscape last 15, last 10, 15 years. Um, but let's look now, I mean, some of these companies that started during the shared economy bubble are not gonna survive because now you don't wanna share 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like an air or a car, you know, you don't want to share a ride, you know, like a small car when now we talk about pandemic, pandemic, uh, like, um, pandemic. yeah, pandemics and like a uh, huge health risks sharing someone's car or staying in someone's house that you don't know who had in that house last two weeks. So many companies come and go, you know, all the time. And those ones who don't pivot to new sectors, new technologies are not going to adopt the world. I think today, uh, the new change that coming, I think still they're going to take some time for companies and organizations and individuals going to realize that that is further digitization of workspace. So uh, workplace collaboration, uh, Slack, Zoom, yeah, I mean, those are the trends that already we're seeing, you know, upside movement in stock markets for all these technologies. But it's not limited to that. I mean, video conferencing is like 30 year old technology. <laughs> it's nothing new. The only thing is we were talking about Skype 30 years ago, and now we talk about Zoom because Zoom was able to adapt, you know, to this system. Now we were talking about Yammer of Microsoft 10 years ago when we talk about workspace collaboration. Now we're talking about Slack or we're talking about Microsoft Teams. So there will be new software companies that will be um, improving their positions in the competitive landscape of Silicon Valley. But one thing I should say that is the, the companies or individuals must see those changes coming. And again, the biggest change coming is digitalization. So there will be, uh, I see next 10 years or 15 years or 20 years until the next crisis. <laughs> and we don't know what the next crisis is going to be. You know, maybe it will be alien invasion and we're going to talk about space technologies and we don't know, you know. <laughs> so the today's, today's problem is basically um, that people avoid social contact, physical contact, and everything must be digital. And what does it mean? It means uh, there will be more cryptocurrencies. There will be more workspace collaboration. There will be more AI technologies, combination of human and machine. Um, uh, there will be, uh, you know, advances to communications. AR gonna be a major, and VR and AR gonna be major um, parts of the companies. Now, Zoom is such a like a outdated technology. That's not a impressive technology that I'm talking to you guys, you know, small boxes on my screen. The, the, you know, probably in five years, we will be having this conversation in one of us living room or in a, like a conference room, feeling like I'm sitting next to you, but then I'm looking at a stupid small screen on my house, you know? So those are the companies that are gonna determine the future of technology. And that will be the major advancement in our lifestyles. And that's it, but I'm open to answer questions. So like uh, a, a piece of technology that can allow a hologram to sit next to you and have a meeting? Sure, it exists. You remember 2016 presidential elections when CNN was hologramming people? Oh, yeah. yes, that's true. I mean, you, those things exist, you know, they not just became a mainstream tool. So I, there are companies that basically can project you you know, next to you know, next to me on my desk. You know, sitting next to direct. Those are exits. They, they just need to be commercialized. You know, and once they're commercialized, and uh, they will be part of Zoom or whoever they're building it. You know, and most of the time, there will be no new updated version of Zoom. There will be a whole new company that you're gonna hear in two years, and people will be rushing to sign up on a daily basis. Mm, true. Very fair. Are, are there any reactions from the panelists to what was said either by Arpin as a Zhang? Do you guys have any reactions? At all? Uh, no, but I think we're going to talk about the policy side in your future questions. So I'm going to keep my comments to the future questions. All right. Arpin, any reactions or anything you want to say? Yeah, I think I do agree with one aspect that Jenk measure, uh mentioned that this particular crisis is going to just accelerate the trends that we had been seeing uh, for some time. And I was doing a study comparing the Corona crisis with the uh, 14th century Black Death bubonic plague that we uh, saw in Europe. And uh, I know I came to a conclusion that uh, the difference between these two crises is that the bubonic plague or the Black Death 
it overturned the existing trends in the economy, uh, in the society po uh, polity or the economy. It came with the end of feudalism. It brought uh, women into the workforce. It, uh, you know, uh, developed a skill premium for people who had skill. On the other hand, uh, the southern states, uh, which were, uh, you know, city states around Italy and the Mediterranean region, they had the power before the crisis. But after that, you see suddenly uh, northern Europe cities like Antwerp, uh, Holland, uh, then uh, London, Paris, all of these emerging as uh, the new power centers. On the other hand, what uh, we found that we see in this particular crisis is that rather than reversing the trend, this is just accelerating the current trends. And I think the answer lies in the fact that a, in the previous, uh, in the Black Death, what happened was that a majority of the young population uh, who formed the part of the workforce, they perished in that sort of a, uh, you know, pandemic. In this particular pandemic, uh, what we see is it is uh, mostly people who are aged or people who are below the age of 10 uh, who are seeing more fatality rates. And that changes a number of things. It'll be a long discussion, but then, uh, no, I totally agree with what uh, Cheng said that uh, this is a great difference in the kind of crisis that we are seeing that rather than reversing trends, it's accelerating the current one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why does it seem to take a crisis for the government to move or for people to innovate, right? <laughs> well, that's kind of human nature, right? That's also yeah. evolution. Uh, you need like, to feel the need. You need to feel the need. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> Look, I mean, it's like the world, you know, many people dragged their feet to get a smartphone in 2007-8 when the iPhone was invented, you know, many people kept using their non, like, dumb phones, you know, they're called dumb phones, mm -hmm. right? at that point they were called phones, <laughs> you know, they didn't get it, they know, oh, I don't need that, I don't need to check my email 24-7, I don't need to get buzzed every time someone tried to yeah. contact me. And I mean, uh, Luddites, right? I mean, they resist the technology advances. And what happens, those people are being eliminated from workforce. I mean, you cannot be stopped burn against the macro changes or the macro system that push you out of the system. Uh, and, you know, if you want to be part of the economic landscape, you need to adopt those changes. You can drag your feet for a couple of years, but at the end, uh, you know, if you want to keep your job, you need to be open to work from home. <laughs> This is also, I think, the power of marketing as well. So you need to convince people they need it. As the iPhone example, what Cenk has said, like you need to convince people they have the need of checking their emails every time they have their you know, phone with them, or they need to watch constantly you know, uh, videos, or they need to consume content constantly, even they are not at home. So I think first is like we have this kind of crisis and then we really need to, you know, change our way of doing business but i think there is another part without having any crisis by the power of marketing you just push people yes they do need that product or that you know change in the business all right I, any more reactions all right cool so i'm gonna ask one more question and i guess i'll open the floor up to the audience in the interest of time okay so how has the mishandling of the pandemic shaped the global political scene and how will governments be forced to change their minds with, in regards to health, uh, public information and policy after this pandemic? This is open to everyone. Oh, you guys, well, I can start. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Anybody can. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I talk about the technology aspect of changes, but I think policy side is as important as the technology in the business aspect. I think one thing we need to understand is um, the governments have huge uh, responsibility in keeping the system sustainable and make people a part of the system. Because what happens now is digitalization. I mean, I talk about what is the ideal uh, scenario for knowledge people, right? I mean, we like working for a think tank or being a lawyer or being a consultant, academics, journalists, 
but there are huge portions, which portion of the society uh, are, you know, especially in the developing world, are not educated. They're not part of the new economy. And to be realistic, they're not going to be part of the real economy, at least for a generation or two. Or, I mean, and they don't, maybe they don't need to be the part of the real economy because there will be not that many uh, new economy jobs, right? I mean, how many drone operators you need, you know? Imagine everyone becomes like AI expert in Africa. It doesn't. Gonna, it's not going to work. So basically, there will be like a large portion of the world they won't have significant income, and uh, maybe they won't have income. So what does it mean? It means uh, there will be more income disparity. There will be significant societal pressures. There will be more risk of social unrest, and there will be. Uh, serious levels of frustrations with the companies or you know, with the companies and also the government so we need to be ready for that and what does it mean that's the time to talk about universal basic income we need to talk about the fact that the governments and also technology companies because they are the ones changing the landscape uh, because and also is in their favor i mean i've been many private meetings with all these technology firms, I'm not gonna name, but look, if you are like, if you are centralizing all the shopping in the world, right? I mean, if you're a company that everyone buys their toilet paper from you or shampoos from you or books from you, so who's gonna buy those stuff if you eliminate all the middle income people, right? I mean, they need yeah. their consumers. They need people who are gonna be consumers of these companies. So is in Amazon's interest to have UBI. So people still keep using you because if you're a florist on the corner, you're not going to have enough income. So you're not going to use those Netflix streaming because you're not going to have like the additional income to watch cool shows, you know, because like, because I mean, they need, so all the technology companies, let me put it that way. All the actors of new economy, and governments must understand the importance of keeping the lifestyle sustainable for large proportions of the world population amidst the upcoming changes next two decades. That's one thing. That's an ideal, uh, very reasonable reaction to the, you know, what's happening to the world macro changes. Do we live in such a governmental situation right now with all these countries? No, we have the most irreasonable and most like, uh, uh, I would say crazy world leadership that we have last 30 years. So the reaction will be what Neza had mentioned earlier, like right wing, you know, they're, not, they're gonna avoid the core and essence of the problem. And Trump will talk more about anti-immigration he gonna he was gonna talk about why you know tax taxpayers should pay all these people that don't you know that knows to pay UBI. So UBI is a liberal policy option here. Who talks about UBI? Liberal left has been talking about UBI in UK, in the US, in Western Europe, in India. So people who are talking about UBI are reasonable policymakers or world leaders, they realize the importance of keeping the system sustainable. But people like Nezhat mentioned, Orban, Trump, uh, and many other right-wing populist leaders, they, their short-term goal is to keep their power. And in order to keep their uh, power, you know, in order to stay in power, they will avoid those long-term trends and they will avoid what the countries, uh, what their countries and what their populations need and they will uh, avoid those uh, long-term policy requirements. And that's why I say, I agree, there will be more protectionist policies in trade. And we see that with China and um, we see that with, um, you know, many, uh, like we see that with UK now. We will see, we will see more nationalism, more right-wing populism uh, next 10 years. And things are gonna get much worse than it is until things maybe may get better. But uh, we don't even know at this point. I mean, this is uh, this is why I'm not very optimistic about the res policy responses to uh, changing ecosystem in the world. Mm. All right. Go ahead. 
I I already mentioned a little bit about this in my you know previous answer. Uh, again, like for the policy changes, we can see the far right will be more you know sharp, and we will see more this kind of you know populism among the politicians. Also, we'll see more isolation, xenophobia, this kind of stuff. But also, if I can add more what I said previously before on the managing the information policy and how it should change afterwards this crisis um, as i as i said before i want to believe that this crisis has shown to the world leaders and public officials that the need to act in swiftly but in honest and transparent way during this kind of crisis so accepting mistakes and correcting them is also so crucial for public safety and can be a matter of life and death this kind of you know circumstances so uh, when large scale and sudden health challenges strike like this one, uh, political leadership is so essential for coordinating response and communicating to the public accurate, up-to-date information about the threat. So I think at the same time, we can see more radical you know, politics. But on the other hand, I want to believe that this crisis will make you know, governments more, you know, working on their you know credi credibility also they will follow a more transparent information policy this is what i want to believe yeah so uh john if i can uh, come in here i think i do agree with uh nezahat and Cheng on one aspect that we definitely will see more authoritarianism and uh, more right-wing governments coming up and the reason for that is simple. Uh, whenever you know a state or a group of people they are faced with scarcity, human psychology is uh, such that uh, scarcity puts a lot of cognitive burden. There have been uh, studies that uh, you know when you're when you're poor, when you're uh, you know short on resources, uh, your cognitive capacities of making complex decisions it goes down, and uh, what do you want? What do you need uh, when you're under such cognitive stress? You need a leader to come in and say that, okay, I'm going to take those decisions for you. And there have been studies which show that economies which see a downturn and when people come into that sort of a scarcity mindset, their preference for an authoritarian figure, it goes up. So certainly that's one thing that I do see happening. Uh, where I think I would differ a little bit is in terms of, uh, you know, whether globalization would break down. And here, I would like to bring in uh, this distinction between globalization and in, uh, internationalization. Because I feel that if we define globalization as something that, okay, the world playing by certain common rules and, uh, you know, coming to certain consensus of, uh, you know, approaching policies and coordinating policies together, that I think will break down, for sure. They might mirror each other's policies, but then international regimes, uh, you know, uh, common rules of, uh, you know, uh, playing the game. I think that is going to suffer the brunt for sure. But internationalization, which is uh, human to human contact internationally, uh, it might seem right now that it is going down, but then uh, you know, as uh, Jenk said that, uh, you know, we are looking at a future where, uh, you know, uh, VR, AR, all of those technologies are going to be a commonplace thing. I could be sitting in India and I could be attending a class uh, and that we could do even right now on Zoom, but then I could really be, uh, you know, uh, experiencing the campus at Cornell, for example, in the US just uh, through this VR, AR technology. And uh, that, when it does become... Uh, large scale when it's commercialized to a level where more and more people can afford it uh, then the human to human contact across uh, countries it's going to uh, be less costly it's going to be easier and it's going to increase so i think uh, that is one thing that we can definitely uh, see happening in the future you also asked that uh, okay how has the crisis been mishandled i think it has been mishandled from the beginning you now right from uh, China uh, not declaring uh, the intensity of the crisis, com communicating the intensity of the crisis from the get-go to, uh, you know, uh, 
European countries or the US living under cognitive dissonance uh, that, uh, okay, uh, this is not something that is gonna uh, be so big that we need to put, uh, bring our economy to a halt. Uh, and we know that, you know, uh, that sort of a, a lack of uh, concern about this uh, crisis, it has led to uh, the virus being spread into uh, millions and millions of people now. So, uh, you know, that sort of a cognitive dissonance that we uh, have as human beings that has really cost us dearly. Uh, so I believe that what we need to learn as human beings in general is... Uh, now, if we were to err on one side, let us err on the side of uh, being over cautious and being over responsive uh, to some of these changes that we, that we are seeing rather than, uh, you know, uh, being laggards or uh, just uh, getting our cognitive dissonance to take the better of us. All right. Thank you for that. So... In the chat here, we have a couple questions, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to take two. And I'm going to unmute Ashen to speak, to ask his question. Let me, give me a quick second. Uh, hi, Jonathan. I, uh, I have to restrict my video as of now, uh, but I think the audio should do fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I had uh, two questions, but uh, in the interest of time, the, the panelists could pick one, uh, whichever uh, suits their time limit. One is, uh, we see, uh, so there are two things. One is that irrespective of the political situation, the global political situation since, uh, I'd say, the 15th century or, or, or around about then, uh, we have seen a cyclical change in regimes globally. So there's been a left-wing uh, significance that has increased over a period of time, which has lasted a century. Then there's been a right-wing uh, uproar of sorts. And this cycle has kind of continued uh, for the past five, six centuries. Uh, uh, this would be even within the ambit of authoritarianism. So if you have to relate it to state of nature and then social contract and then uh, state of nature again, uh, strictly in terms of uh, Rousseau or or Hobbes. So this is one. And how does the pandemic play a role uh, despite these cycles that we have observed over the, over the past uh, centuries? Uh, in the context of what you guys are saying, that there shall be a right-wing rise, which has already been happening for the past, uh, say, 20 years, or at least since uh, 1990s, uh, early 90s at least. And the second thing is because all of these things are often affected or, or, or have been relatable on the game theory itself, uh, would the game theory play a part to, uh, to an extent where the least favorable outcome might be to blame your neighbor or blame the international community as opposed to a more cognitive, reasonable, rationalized approach to actually improve your own governance structures? Okay, uh, John, can I answer that real oh, quick? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll take the first one, uh, first question first. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, what's happening over here is, uh, you know, you see flocks of birds uh, and flocks of birds, uh, you know, system scientists uh, discovered that there's no one bird which leads the whole flock. The birds kind of coordinate locally. They look to uh, the birds who are flying around them and they see uh, which bird is, uh, you know, uh, moving in what direction. And then if, uh, you know, the bird to my left and right are moving towards the left and right, then I'll just follow them. Uh, the second one is that you broadly follow the wind currents. Uh, that's what you do. And the third one is that if a predator is coming, then, you know, uh, you just move away and then find your flock again and you know start applying rule number one and rule number two so if you see that uh, global systems also just like these bird uh, systems they are working on certain simple rules which are interacting with each other global systems also uh, work on simple rules which interact with each other 
Uh, and these simple rules, while they interact, they create complex patterns. Now what happens, and there are uh, a lot of historical papers on this, that how every uh, one century or every two centuries, uh, there's a new reality that global systems face. And in that new reality, they have to adapt themselves. And it's much like the birds. So, uh, you know, the birds have been functioning on these three rules, but now the telephonic wires come up. And with these telephonic poles and signals, the birds are not able to coordinate and navigate uh, the way that they used to. So they are not able to adapt to the new reality. And that's why you see, uh, you know, Silence of the Spring, the book uh, talks about this, that how the birds weren't able to adapt to this and uh, this new reality and a lot of uh, bird species started to die. Similarly, in human beings, what happens is that when we are faced with this new reality, our current systems, they start breaking down and then, uh, you know, we kind of uh, throw caution in the air, we panic and then we try and figure out a new system. And in figuring out a new system, as I said, that in that whole panic and the reduction of our cognitive, uh, you know, uh, the cognitive capacities or the load that we can uh, take, we look out for right-wing leaders and that we see, uh, you know, just before the Second World War that we are seeing right now. So uh, I think it's a pattern that, you know, uh, when we uh, lose our composure, uh, when the system is breaking down, we tend to do, do that as a species. All right, thank you. Any other responses or reactions from the panel? Okay, so, all right, so let's move on to the last question, which is a uh, closing thoughts. So my last question is, I would like for the panelists to also use this as an opportunity to reflect and give any closing thoughts. So what are the lessons needed to be taken by the international, national, and local authorities and governments? Anyone can start. Nizahat, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay, okay. I was just waiting because I mentioned this in my previous answer a little bit more about more since my area is more about information policy. So uh, as I said, like really governments need to work on their credibility and transparency. But if I might add a little bit more, uh the, to the lessons that the governments and the authorities need to take so governments needs to consider that how the public is likely to respond their you know orders or their policies and what role trust might play in shaping their you know the public uh, receptiveness and compliance uh, this is the one thing as i previously mentioned before, but also what is important here, another essential factor. So in this age of, you know, fake news or alternative facts, so there has been a while, the science and research has not been so much regarded by the officials and media, also by the public for a while. So this crisis uh, might be maybe an opportunity to understand that science matters, the facts matter. So maybe we can use this understanding on other highly disputed subjects in politics like climate change, maybe. Thank you for that. Cenk? Yeah, I mean, um, really, I don't have that much to add after what I mentioned, but for, I think what this crisis shows everyone that transparency is key in dealing with crises like that. I think that's the only, you know, that's the bottom line. That's the only very important thing that we should mention. If you look what happened in, you know, in December in China, the lack of communication, then in the U.S. in January, February period, uh, in Turkey uh, in March. Uh, so obviously leaders knew more than they, what they shared. And things could get much um, better, you know, things could be much better if those communications will be passed. If we will do a lockdown in the US in January, February, uh, probably we would avoid many human losses. Uh, the same thing, uh, you know, in China. China, like, basically, you know, uncovered the, you know, the facts for a whole month. And maybe that virus could be, you know, I don't agree with, uh, 
uh, Trump's views on blaming China. I mean, I believe that was a, a very, they, no one knew what that was, but uh, maybe the virus could be isolated in Asia. And again, I was traveling in Asia in January and February this year, and uh, I was shot. I mean, I spent almost a month in uh, Singapore and Japan, and that was at the top of the agenda. Uh, I know also like uh, India, I was talking to my team in India, and people were talking about coronavirus in January, in early February. No one was talking about coronavirus in the US up until mid-February, late February. The same in Turkey. I mean, for example, Turkey basically said there were no cases to March 16, and within a month there were like uh, 10,000 cases, you know, within, within a month. So that's not possible. Uh, the same thing in the US. Uh, so transparency is the most important uh, factor. I think one hope that I have about the, you know, improving the political landscape is crisis like that uh, make it very visible uh, to show the effectiveness of the politician. Like for example, look at the US. Uh, I mean, John, you can agree with that. Uh, Cuomo like rises as a superstar after yeah. uh, crisis because he had a press briefing every day and he didn't start his press briefing how great things gonna be or how we're gonna make New York great again he talked about how screw up things are in New York and you know New York must be tough and deal with it uh, and they provided a lot of credibility and trust because you know but Trump was saying it's not gonna happen nothing gonna happen You'll be fine. The, there will be no crisis in January. So then things go worse. They don't. So I hope uh, in the local level in the U.S., I think D.C. mayor did a great job. Uh, New York, uh, uh, I think even New York City mayor, Blasio, did a good job. Uh, but there were also some crazy mayors in the South who basically almost like organized those protests against COVID. But people see it, you know. If you're like pushing, insisting on doing your uh, church service because you think that's a, like a human rights violation, if you go to that church and you get all freaking get COVID and die, and next day you don't have credibility, you know, it's, it's a major fact. <laughs> You die if you do something stupid. You know, you cannot like change statements on this. It's not like a abstract political things that you can blame worsening economic crisis because of immigration or something. It's a very simple uh, cause and act. You go to church in the middle of the COVID in the South, you, you know, pray together with 100 people and the next week, 25 of them get COVID is a fact. So hope, uh, People will realize who, you know, make better decisions, and you know, on the local level, is easy to see. In the global and macro level, is a little bit more, you know, ambiguous. So, uh, so hope uh, people will realize the importance of transparency and how transparent and reasonable decisions uh, translate or convert into like a smart, a life-saving, uh, you know, like a moves in policy. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Arpit? Yeah, so uh, I agree with what Nizahat and Cenk said. Uh, I would just like to add that a couple of things would become uh, very clear after this. Uh, a, agendas like healthcare, agendas like climate change, agendas like poverty. Now it's been proven, uh, you know, beyond uh, any doubt that people uh, used to harbor earlier, even the naysayers used to have it, it has been proven that these are top agendas. And, you know, uh, to be honest, these have been top agendas for humankind since forever. I think uh, it is surprising that, uh, you know, these agendas got down the priority ladder somewhere in between, but then you read your ancient uh, texts, whether you're uh, reading, uh, you know, the ancient texts of India or Mesopotamia or Egypt, what do you see people doing? People, you see people uh, praying the nature, uh, all of the policies trying to approximate how, uh, you know, the weather is going to play out. Uh, how is the human interaction with the nature, with the animals, with the forests playing out? And these were uh, supposed to be skills that, uh, 
you know, uh, that kind of uh, made a difference between an intelligent and a not so intelligent human being. These were, these were you know, uh, fundamental primary obsessions. And, uh, you know, uh, this message has come home again that, uh, you know, it's healthcare, nature, uh, education, the environment, all of these things are real and uh, these are the fundamental policy concerns, uh, you know, uh, rather than a lot of other things that we uh, have been talking about in the middle. All right, thank you. So um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their time and just being a part of the panel and you've provided some very deep and interesting insights and I hope that some governments listen to what you guys have said <laughs> and change their policies accordingly. So that concludes the end of this panel. Uh, once again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you for the participants who attended and viewed the panel. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for so having much, us. Austin.